أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا آتنا من لذنك رحمة وهي لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم جعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم آمين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters uh, I was uh, given this uh, topic of uh, Surah Al-Munafiqun and in order to understand uh, the verses of Surah Al-Munafiqun we need to understand a little bit about uh, the history uh, we need to understand uh, the rise of the Munafiqun and uh, and the event behind uh, event that happened uh, behind the surah. So we'll start with. Uh, I have to go a little bit back uh, to talk about uh, the Battle of uh, Bu'ath. Um, so as we all know, in Medina, in addition to having Aws and Khazraj the two Ansari tribes. We also had uh, many uh, different uh, Jewish tribes. We had uh, Banu Qaynuqa and uh, Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir. And the two uh, Arab tribes or pagan tribes, if you will, the Al Khazraj and Al Aus, they were not getting along for a very long time. As a matter of fact, some historians, they say that uh, they had issues, they were fighting each other for over 120 years. And most of the time, Al Khazraj, uh, they were coming out victorious uh, in the battle uh, because they are uh, the largest tribe uh, compared to uh, Al Aus. And uh, they had an alliance, Al Khazraj, uh, they had an alliance with Banu Khaynuqa. And then Al Aus, uh, they had alliance with Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir. So this fight was going on between Al Khazraj and uh, Al Aus for a very long time. And like I said, most of the time Al Khazraj, they won the battle. So one time Al Aus, they said, okay, this is not working out for us. We are not able to uh, fight Al Khazraj. What we could do is let's go to Banu Quraida and Banu uh, Nadir and we'll ask them for their support. And prior to this, they also sought the support of uh, the Quraysh, but uh, the Quraysh, they declined it. So just before, uh, three to five years before uh, the Prophet's arrival in Medina, the Battle of Bu'ath take place. So what led to this battle? So when al Aus went to Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir and asked when they sought their support, somehow this news went to al Khazraj. So the Al Khazraj then uh, called uh, Banu, uh, Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir, and they said, "We heard that you are uh, forming an alliance with Al Aus to fight us. Is that true?" And at that time, uh, the Jewish tribes they said that we don't have any plans of fighting you by forming an alliance with them. So, uh, but again, Al Khazraj they did not believe. So they asked 40 men from the Jewish tribes as mortgage. So they said, "You have to give 40 people, 40 young men from you." As a, a, as a security, uh, if you will. So, and they agreed and they left their 40 young men uh, with Al Khazraj. But even after that, uh, some historians say uh, that they uh, demanded uh, uh, that Al Khazraj demanded that they also give their property, the Jew, uh, demanded the Jewish tribes to hand over their property, uh, which led to uh, the Battle of uh, Bu'ath. Uh, and of, since they broke the treaty, Al Khazraj, they decided to kill uh, the 40 people. And uh, Qa'ab al Quraidi, he, he was the one who uh, basically led the battle from, uh, uh, from uh, Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir uh, along with Al Aus. And that was one of the bloodiest battles uh, in the history of uh, Medina. So this is uh, called the Battle of Bu'ath. And in the Battle of Bu'ath, like I said, many people were killed. Many of the leaders from both sides were killed. And uh, then they now they have to come up with some sort of a compromise because the Battle of Bu'ath, even though 
Laos, they won the battle uh, by a small margin, but you cannot call anyone victorious. So they had to come to some sort of a compromise. So what they did was to secure the truce, they uh, uh, assigned or they agreed to have Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul as the leader. So the Battle of Bu'ath directly led to the leadership of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. They decided to appoint him as a leader, as the king uh, for both tribes. And prior to this, no, at no point in the history of the two tribes that they were getting together, that they agreed to have one common leader. But this is the first time since they went to uh, the brim of death, they decided to have Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul as the head of the tribes. And around this time, the, they heard about the messages from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca. And uh, and we know what happened. Uh, a delegation from uh, Medina came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know about uh, Aqaba 1 and Aqaba 2. And then finally, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he migrated, he made the Hijrah to uh, Medina. And when he went to uh, Medina, a lot of people, of course, we know uh, both Ansar, uh, the Ansar, uh, uh, the tribes, which is basically Al Aus and Al Khazraj, they rallied behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, uh, and Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he did not like this. And, uh, but again, due to the social pressure and to save his leadership position, he had to outwardly accept Islam. So when he saw the tribal leaders from both tribes rallying behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and most of the people embracing Islam from both tribes, he didn't have an option but to accept Islam outwardly to save his leadership and due to some social pressure. But Iman did not enter his heart. And there were many examples that the Mufassirin uh, gave about his, uh, uh, about, uh, his behavior towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, went, he was going to visit uh, Saad ibn Ubadah radiallahu anh because, because he heard him that he was sick. So he went to uh, see uh, Saad uh, radiallahu anh, but on the way he saw uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. And, uh, when, uh, and when he saw Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, sitting with uh, his people, he wanted to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted to go and give them some information about Islam, teach them about Islam. So he took his mule to, uh, uh, to Abdullah ibn Ubay. But Abdullah ibn Ubay, he said that don't bring your donkey here. It is, uh, it, uh, your donkey has a bad smell. You cannot come here, you cannot teach us and whatnot. So he, uh, uh, he said some harsh words to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously he was upset. And then he went to Saad ibn Ubay radiallahu and he said, why is Abdullah ibn Ubay, he's reacting this way. And Saad said that, Ya Rasulullah, don't mind him because before your arrival, we were planning to appoint him as the king. He were planning to appoint him as the leader of, the, uh, of our two tribes. But since your arrival, that plan has changed. So that's why uh, he's a little irritated and that's why he has enmity, uh, enmity towards you. So Saad ibn Ubad radiallahu and he said, he consoled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As a matter of fact, sometimes uh, when the Prophet, uh, uh, sometimes uh, during the Friday prayers, Abdullah ibn Ubay, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he, when he stands up to give the khutbah, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he would immediately stand up right after him and he would address uh, the companions and he would say, here is your Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet through which he has honored you. And he said that you have to obey him, you have to listen to him, you have to support him. So he is actually trying to create an atmosphere where he's showing his support of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he is witnessing, where he is uh, test, uh, testifying that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Prophet and uh, and whatnot. Then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, we know from uh, Surah Al-Munafiqun, he said, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ This is the first verse of Surah Al-Munafiqun. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, when the hypocrites come to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they say, we testify that you are the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows that you are his messenger. And Allah testifies that the hypocrites are liars. And this is one incident. And of course, uh, in the incident of, uh, in the battle of Badr, uh, 
uh, when the, after the Battle of Badr, uh, because of the violation of the treaty by Banu Qaynuka, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the Muslims to fight Banu Qaynuka and drive them out. And at that time, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he held on to his uh, armor and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you cannot do this to uh, Banu Qaynuka. They are my, they are, they, are, they are the people we had some relationship with. You cannot drive them out. So even after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a decision about Banu Qaynuka, uh, he acted very uh, harshly with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we all know what happened in the Battle of Uhud when the, the, when the Prophet's army of 1,000 uh, people met with 3,000 people of uh, the Quraysh uh, due, to, um, uh, due to Abdullah ibn Ubay, 300 of those people, they backed out. They backed out Abdullah ibn Ubay and his supporters, 30% of the people, they went back to Medina without fighting in the Battle of uh, Uhud. And right after this, uh, as usual, when he stood up to uh, say the same things that you would normally say saying that he is your prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored you through, uh, through your prophet You should listen to him and obey him and what now when he tried to say that he was disgraced by the people People shouted at him and they shouted him uh, down and they said you are not you don't you're not fit to make these statements We all saw what you did in the battle of Uhud. You're not uh, you're not a Muslim They shouted at him and then of course this uh, made uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, very angry and then uh, he basically jumped upon the people and left the uh, left the prayer hall. And on his way out, some after some of the Ansar, they said, "Why are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you reacting this way? Why don't you go and ask the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for his forgiveness?" And of course, he rejected. Again, you can go on and on about uh, the activities of uh, the hypocrites, especially uh, of uh, Ibn Ubay. So I just wanted to kind of give you the history of the rise of the Munafiqun, how they uh, uh, how they uh, came to uh, came into existence, if you will, and uh, their stronghold became more evident after the Battle of Badr, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in uh, Surah Al-Anfal. So let's uh, move on and uh, go to uh, the Battle of uh, Bani Al-Mustaliq. So this is the incident that led to the revelation of Surah Al-Munafiqun. So what I uh, told you before is just the introduction about the rise of the Munafiqun because you need to have that understanding uh, to uh, understand this particular uh, surah completely and comprehensively. So after the Battle of uh, Uhud and and the apparent defeat of the Muslims, it uh, that emboldened some of the surrounding tribes of uh, Medina, and one of such tribe is Banu Mustaliq. And some companion and some of the historians say that this battle took place in uh, five uh, after Hijra or five Hijra or six Hijra, uh, but some lean towards. As a matter of fact, Ibn Hiz, uh, Ibn Hishaq, um, he uh, leans towards the six after Hijra, but that's not uh, the primary point, uh, if you will. So Banu Banil uh, Mustalik, uh, they were also emboldened by uh, by the apparent defeat of the Muslims in the Battle of Uhud. And they lived on the highway between uh, Mecca and Medina, and they are a subtribe of uh, Khuza'a. The leader of uh, the Banu al-Mustaliq, his name is Al-Harith uh, ibn Abi Dirar. Al-Harith ibn Abi Dirar al-Khuza'i. Uh, al he decided to uh, plan an attack uh, on the Muslims uh, right in Medina, and he gathered his people, and, they, and he said that uh, the Muslims are weak now. The Quraysh, they were able to defeat the Muslims. This is our time. Why don't we... Uh, attack the Muslims in Medina and uh, and destroy them. So somehow this news came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as always, he didn't want to just take an action against uh, Banil Mustalik. So he sent uh, some people to go gather some information. So uh, his people went and uh, looked at the situation in Banil Mustalik, and they confirmed the news that indeed Al Harith ibn Dirar uh, he is planning to um, uh, fight the Muslims and attack the Muslims. And, uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to avoid bloodshed, he thought of attacking them uh, pre uh, preemptively. Uh, and so he gathered his forces of uh, 700 Muslims and 30 horses. So he went to uh, Banil Mustaliq and met, uh, at, uh, met them uh, a well uh, called Muraisi, Mel, uh, well near Muraisi. And Muraisi is just in the outskirts of uh, where the Banil Mustaliq uh, they were staying. So. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked the companions to attack early in the morning. So it was a surprise attack on Bani al and they were not prepared to fight. And it was an easy, easy victory for uh, for the Muslims. A lot of people, a lot of men and women, they were imprisoned and they also um, uh, uh, got some spoils of war. And this led to 
Uh, as a matter of fact, this led to uh, the marriage of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with uh, Juwayriya radiallahu anha as well, which is not the uh, which is not uh, of interest for today, uh, if you will. So Bani uh, uh, the, the it was a clear victory for the Muslims, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam decided to camp at Al Muraisi. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked the Muslims to camp at Al Muraisi, and uh, and at the time. Uh, a uh, dispute happened between an, an Ansari and, uh, and, a Muhajir, uh, and a Muhajir. A man by name of uh, Jihja uh, bin Masood al-Ghifari, uh, he was a servant of Umar radiallahu uh, anhu. He asked, um, he actually used to water the horses and whatnot. So uh, Jihja, he went to the well to uh, draw some water. At that time, another Ansari uh, uh, by the name of uh, Sinan. So Jihja is a Muhajir and Sinan is an Ansari. Uh, he was originally from uh, Yemen, so Sinan uh, ibn Wabar al-Juhani. So he went. He also went to the uh, the water well, and apparently something happened between the two, and they uh, got into some uh, argument. And uh, eventually, uh, Jahja kicked uh, uh, Jahja kicked uh, Sinan in his feet. So Jahja got irritated since he was from uh, Yemen, and he had that pride within him being an Yemeni. He called all the Ansari to come and support him, and Jahja did the same thing by calling all the uh, Muhajir to come and support him uh, as well. And uh, so they started shouting at each other, and uh, a, a fight was almost about to break out. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he heard the sound, and he came out and he asked, and the hadith goes, Samiya Dalik Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he came out and he asked, what is this call for paganism? So, Ya Rasulullah, a person from a Muhajir, he kicked a person from the Ansar. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, muntina. He said that, leave this call for paganism. It is muntina, it is filthy, it is stinking. Uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he calmed down uh, both uh, the Ansar, uh, 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 both the Ansar and the and, and the Muhajir. As a matter of fact, uh, Ubad ibn Samit radiallahu an he also came and advised uh, Sinan uh, radiallahu an and Jahja radiallahu an. Finally, uh, uh, Jahja he uh, uh, he uh, accepted that he made a mistake and uh, he asked for excuse and Sinan uh, he pardoned Jahja and the peace was restored. So this was happening. And obviously, this was an uh, opportunity for Abdullah ibn Ubay to uh, create some more confusion and friction between uh, Muhajir and Ansar. But he was not able to do it because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and came out and uh, said what he said, and finally peace was restored. So Abdullah ibn Ubay, uh, uh, having been disappointed, disappointed, he went back to his uh, tent, and some of his supporters followed him to the tent as well. And they came to Abdullah ibn Ubay, who was already angry. He said that. Uh, oh Abdullah, we thought that you're going to save us. We had high hopes in you. We thought you're going to give us protection. We're going to, you're going to protect us from the Muslims and the, from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From what we saw today, that uh, you, you are you are powerless. You are helpless. You cannot protect from us. So they started complaining to Abdullah ibn Ubay, which angered him more. And then he started Abdullah ibn Ubay. He started shouting back at the supporters, and he said that you are the one who supported the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You are the one who gave him shelter. You are the one who uh, gave him financial mean, uh, means. You are the ones who gave you uh, who gave your property to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said that nothing fits us, as the old Qurayshi saying, which goes like, "Feed your dog to fatten it, and it will devour you." So he said these harsh and rude and insolent words about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he talks about this in Surah Al-Munafiqoon where he says, Humu al-ladheena yaquluna la tunfiku ala man inda rasoolullahi hatta yan rasoolillahi hatta yan faddu wa lillahi khazayinu samawati wal ard wa lakinna al-munafiqina la yafqahoon yaquluna la irraja'na ila al-madinati la yukhrujanna al-a'azzu minha al-adhal وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ So they are the ones who came uh, and uh, said, Abdullah ibn Ubay and his people, they are the ones who said, don't spend on those who are with the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until they go, uh, go away, until they disband. And to Allah belongs the depositories of the heavens, to Allah belongs the treasures of the heavens and the earth, but the hypocrites do not understand. 
They also said that if we return to Al Madina, the more honored one. So he's talking about himself, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he's talking about himself calling him and his people the more honored ones. The more honored one will surely expel they're from the more humble, the mean ones. He called the Prophet وسلم, and his companions as the mean ones. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and Allah says, and to Allah belongs all honor. And to Allah belongs all honor and to his messenger and to the believers, but the hypocrites do not know. So this incident happened when he was saying these words, there was another person who was sitting uh, in the crowd, a young man and a young boy by the name of Zaid ibn Arkham radiallahu anh. He was sitting in the crowd, and when he heard Abdullah uh, ibn Abay say these words, he was very, he got very angry, and he said, I don't know why you said this. I'm going to go tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about what you said. At this point, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he was trying to console uh, Zayd ibn Arkham saying that, no, no, I was just trying to joke. I don't, I don't mean to do anything to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You can ignore it. But he, Zayd ibn uh, Arkham being an young boy, he went to his uncle who then went to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So they told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay had said. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even after hearing this, look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he knows Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He knows what kind of a person Abdullah ibn Ubay was. But even then he said, Zaid, is it possible that you misheard him? Is it possible that you misheard him? But Zaid said, no, I did not misheard him. This is exactly what he said. Then he promised. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he called Abdullah ibn Ubay. And he said, he asked, uh, Zaid is here saying that you uh, you said all these uh, harsh words about uh, the Muslims, about myself and uh, the companions. Is that true? And obviously, uh, Ibn Ubay, he uh, denied saying such statements. As a matter of fact, there were some Ansaris present with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that time. They also said, Ya Rasulullah, don't, uh, uh, don't bother uh, Abdullah Ibn Ubay based on the words of a young, uh, young boy. But the Prophet Sallallahu he knew in his heart that he was telling the truth. But of course, he, since he didn't have any proof, he let uh, Ibn Ubay go. At the moment, at this moment, Umar radiallahu an, as we all know, uh, Umar with the stick, uh, we all know what kind of a personality uh, he is. He said, Ya Rasulullah, give me the permission so that I can go execute this uh, traitor, Abdullah ibn Ubay. And if you don't permit me, if you think that it, this is going to create a, a, a trouble between uh, Muhajir and Ansar, why don't you give permission to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anh so that he can go, uh, or Mu'ad ibn Jabal, so they can go and one of them can go and kill Abdullah ibn Ubay. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that no, uh, he did not give them permission. And he said that uh, it is not befitting for a, a messenger to be called that he's killing his own um, uh, companions. So having heard this, Abdullah ibn, ibn Ubay's son, he also got wind of this information, and uh, his name is also Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay radiallahu anhu. So he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard that my, my father said this. If you want, you can, uh, I mean, uh, 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 if you decide to kill him, uh, just let me know. I don't want anybody else besides me to kill my uh, dad, because if somebody were to kill my dad, then if I see him free uh, later on, then I wouldn't be able to control my anger towards that person. So if you decide to kill him, just give me the permission to kill him and not allow anybody else to do it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, no, we're not going to kill anybody. Just go back. So the Prophet, and again, this news was spreading uh, spreading like wildfire amongst the camp. So the Prophet وسلم, he decided to uh, uh, he decided to take an action that he would normally uh, not take. So he asked the entire uh, 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 camp to vacate the place and start the travel towards Medina, which is about 30 hours uh, uh, travel. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, usually he does not travel at this time, uh, but he decided to, uh, to avoid the dispute further, to avoid uh, misunderstandings between the tribes further. He decided to just set out uh, for Medina. And during the travel, during the travel as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going, Zayd ibn Arkham, he was very, very disappointed that uh, uh, people thought that he was a liar. So he was coming close. He, he brought his camel close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's camel, thinking that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala would reveal something uh, to support him. And indeed, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uh, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed the entire Surah Al-Munafiqun uh, 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 during that trip back to uh, Medina. When after the revelation of the Prophet, after the revelation, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
he uh, came closer to Zayd and he held on to his ear and he said, Ya Ghulam, he said, Ya Ghulam, Sadaqallahu hadithak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has confirmed you. He has proved your words veracity. وَنَزَلَتْ سُورَةُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed Surah Al-Munafiqeen fi Ibn Ubay. It is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Munafiqeen about Ibn Ubay. Min awwaliha ila akhiriha. From the beginning to end, it's all about him. It's all about what he did. And during the trip, uh, another Ansar uh, chief, he came to, uh, uh, by the name of Usaid bin Hudayr, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you don't normally set out at this time. Why did you do this? And he said, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, did you listen to what your uh, 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 your friend said? Uh, friend Abdullah ibn Ubay said, he said, yeah, I, I didn't know. I don't know about that, Ya Rasulullah. What did he do? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had confirmed uh, uh, in the Quran. And again, the news spread like wildfire, uh, wildfire and many of the Ansar, they came to, the, came to Abdullah ibn Ubayd and they, uh, they asked him, they requested him to go back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask for his forgiveness, but he decided not to do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again narrates this uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Quran. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا يَسْتَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوَّوْ رُؤُوسَهُمْ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ يَسُدُّونَ وَهُمْ مُسْتَكْبِرُونَ سَوَاوٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَسْتَغْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, when it is said to them, come, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask for forgiveness, will ask forgiveness for you, they turn their heads aside and you see them evading while they are arrogant. It is all the same for them, whether you ask for forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them, Allah will never forgive them. Indeed, Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. And obviously he did not uh, ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's forgiveness. And before they reached Medina, his own son, we talked about Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he blocked the entry of Abdul, Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Ubay into Medina. He came, he came in front of his camel, he brought the camel down, he put his feet on the camel and he said, if you're not going to go back and ask the forgiveness of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then if you're going to, and, and, and prove that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you don't, if you, uh, basically he asked him to confirm that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the honored one then, then, and he is the meanest one. And some Mufassirin, they say that uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he did say that I am the meanest one, worse than, uh, worse than, some, cre- worse than some, some creation. Then he accepted that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the honored one. When this commotion was going on, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came near the gate of Medina and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked what, what was going on. Then he found out that Abdullah did not give entry to his own father. Then he asked, uh, his, uh, he asked him to allow his father to enter uh, Medina, and he finally uh, entered uh, Medina. At this point, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he addressed uh, Omar radiallahu an. He said, "Ya Omar, what do you think now? You asked me to kill uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, but I, I but I told you not to kill him. But if I were to give him permission, if I have to give people permission, then every single one of them will come and take that order." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had that uh, vision, uh, if you will, and he didn't want to p- punish. And we know from the history, we know from the seerah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never punished uh, the munafiqin uh, for their actions. So this is the uh, the entire story behind uh, surah al munafiq uh, surah al munafiqin uh, surah al munafiqun, uh, uh, if you will. Uh, and I have to go through, I had to jump through a lot of details to kind of compress this within uh, the time that we have. I, I'll quickly I'll quickly conclude because there are some lessons that we need to understand from uh, the surah as well. It is good to know about the incident and the background, but we also need to understand the lessons uh, from the surah. The first one is, remember that anyone can be affected by hypocrisy. As a matter of fact, uh, Hassan al Basri, uh, uh, Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah, he said, "Ma khafahu nifaq illa mu'min, wa la aminahu illa munafiq." He said that the only ones who are fearful of becoming a munafiq is a mu'min. Anyone who is fearful of becoming a munafiq is a mu'min, but anyone 
who thinks that he is safe from being a munafiq is indeed a munafiq. So remember that anyone can be affected by this disease of hypocrisy, but it actually happens to those who are in positions of power and uh, leadership. And, uh, and again, don't judge people by outer appear, uh, appearance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, and when you see them, their forms, their look will please you. And if they speak and you will listen to their speech, they are as if they were pieces of wood propped up. They think that every shout is against them. They are the enemy, so beware of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy them. How are they deluded? And Abdullah ibn Ubay, as the historian say, that he was very well built, well, uh, well built, and he was healthy, he was handsome, he was eloquent, but we cannot judge people by the outer appearance. And he was the leader of the munafiqun. He was the uh, leader of the hypocrites. And it is common, uh, as we saw uh, the dispute that happened at the well of Muraisi, uh, disputes happen bet between people that we should not, we should try to bring about reconciliation between uh, uh, the disputing people and not use that, uh, use those opportunities for dividing people, dividing the community and whatnot. And then uh, obviously uh, we also saw that Abdullah ibn Umayyah and his supporters, they had a, sh a secret mashwara where they decided not to spend on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to drive them out. Never have these secret plans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his plans will always work. When you are meeting with someone, have the proper intention to bring goodness to the Muslims, uh, but not any harm. And like, uh, I'm kind of going through uh, uh, a little bit fast. Pay attention and give importance to youth. Zayd ibn Arkam radiallahu an, he was young. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he listened to him. And even after the revelation, he came. He knew that he was disappointed. disappointed so he came to him. And he caught this, he held on to his ear and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he confirmed what you said. Saddaqallahu hadithak. He said that to uh, Zayd. So pay attention and give importance to uh, youth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also, when, issues was, uh, when, uh, when the issue was going around the camp, he decided to uh, not let that go, any, uh, go forward anymore. So he wanted to distract people from uh, that issue and he, after he distracted them by asking them to go on a 30 hour trip uh, from Muraisi to all the way to Medina. So we have to, I mean, if, issue, if issues are not worth attending, just ignore them, deflect them and distract them. You don't have some, not all issues have to be fixed like uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu did here and also have a long-term vision as the Prophet Sallallahu decided not to uh, kill uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, in this incident. So I'm going to uh, pause here. Uh, I also had uh, one more slide uh, about uh, the cure uh, for hypocrisy, uh, which are the later ayahs uh, that are mentioned in uh, uh, in the uh, in the same surah, from ayah number nine to ayah number eleven. Inshallah, if we get some time during the Q and A, inshallah, we can talk about it. Uh, so, inshallah, we will uh, conclude that. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and we can open it up for Q and A. One of the lessons that you reviewed uh, with us is that the one who fears becoming a hypocrite is a mu'min. So this is obviously a very, very important lesson. Can you review for us what are the characteristics, the, the signs of the hypocrite, uh, the signs of hypocrisy, so that we are aware of them and can do our best to try and stay away from those type of characteristics? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm pointing to a hadith uh, in uh, Sahih al-Muslim. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the screen, and Abdullah ibn Amru radiallahu anh, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, arba'un, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's referring to four characteristics, arba'un. Man kunna fihi kana munafiqan khalisun. If people have all these four characteristics, then they are a complete and a comprehensive munafiq. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ فِيهِ خُلَّةٌ مِنْهُنَّ كَانَتْ فِيهِ خُلَّةٌ مِنْ نفاق. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that if, if a person has one of those characteristics, then he has one of the characteristics of a munafiq. حَتَّى يَدْعَهَا Until they give it up. So what are these four characteristics? 
إذا حدث كذب. When they speak, they lie. وإذا عاهد غدر. When they make a covenant, they betray the trust. They betray the covenant. وإذا وعد أخلف. When they promise, they break the promise. وإذا خاصم فجر. When they are debating, when they are arguing, they resort to obscene speech. So four characteristics. When they speak, they lie. When they give a covenant, they betray the covenant. When they promise, they break it. When they argue, they resort to obscene speech. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if a person has all these four characteristics, then he is munafiqan khal yusun. He said he is a complete munafiq. But if a person has one of this, then he should give it. He, then he, is, he has one of the characteristics of nifaq hatta yadaha. This is very important. If a person thinks that he has one of these characteristics, he can give it up. He can repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he can give it up. Then he'll become a mu'min again. Hatta yadaha. As a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Nisa, Inna al munafiqina fi al asfali min al-nar walan tajida lahum nasira. So the munafiqin will be in the bottom. In the bottom of the hellfire, and they will f they will not find any help. tabu, except the ones who repent, aslahu, and they correct their affairs, wa'atasamu billah, and they hold on to Allah subhanahu wa taala, wa akhlasu dinahum lillah, and they become sincere in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Fa'ulaika ma'al mu'minin. Once they repent. And correct their actions and hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be sincere to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself confirms they are from the people of true believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the, uh, uh, the mu'min a great reward in the hereafter. I hope, uh, hope that answers the question. Jazakallah So... As you describe the characteristics of the munafikun, obviously we need to take lesson in this and question what we do, our behavior, and make sure that we stay away from these characteristics. But as we understand what a hypocrite is, is it ever possible or is it ever legitimate to call anybody a, a hypocrite? Or is this something that only resides in the heart and only Allah knows? And so, did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba label anybody a hypocrite or was this only from Allah? The secret, the keeper of the secrets, Hudayfa uh, ibn al-Yaman, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he informed the name of the hypocrites to Hudayfa. And he was the only one who knew who the hypocrites were, and nobody else knew. And of course, people had the idea, right? People uh, at that time, the companions had the idea who the hypocrites were because of their actions. So that's why they were, they didn't, even when Abdullah ibn Ubay, uh, when he died, they did not, they did not allow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to go and uh, pray on him, even though the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, did that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to come back and warn him in Surah Tawbah not to do that ever again. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not punish the munafiq. And as Muslims, we cannot label anyone as a munafiq. And even Umar radiallahu anhu, he thought he was a munafiq. He went to Hudayfa and he asked, my, is my name in there? He was worried that his name was in there. His name was in there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew because Allah revealed it to him. But after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we don't have any right to call anyone a munafiq. But since Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he had the list of the hypocrites. When people doubted, when the companions doubted that person could be a hypocrite, they would actually watch for Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Is he going and praying the funeral prayer on that person? If he does, then they would go. If he does not go, then they would not go. Just to guard themselves because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you can never go and pray on them again. So this is only at the time of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because it was revealed to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa After the time of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the sahabas, they did not call anyone as a munafiq because it is not our duty. 
As a matter of fact, when Ali radiallahu anhu, when he went on a battle, uh, when he went on a battle, he incorrectly killed a Muslim. When he came back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "What happened?" The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him, "Did you open his heart and see what was inside?" We cannot open anyone's heart and see what what's uh, what's inside. So this is when you see anything about the munafiq, it is for our own selves. We ha we have to introspect ourselves and look at our own heart. Do we have and see if we have any of those characteristics? If we do have, then we have to correct ourselves and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We have to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at no point in time we can judge others, judge others because we cannot open people's heart and look what they have in their heart. If we think others, that itself is not a good sign. It is a matter of heart and it is only personally. I cannot call anyone a munafiq and no one can call me anyone a munafiq. So this is an intros we have to introspect individually and look what you have in your heart. If you have something wrong, then you correct it. So one of the things about the munafikun is that they would delay their prayer to the end time and particularly for the asar prayer. Um, why is this uh, important for us to reflect on and how important is it for the Asr prayer um, to be prayed? Um, you know, what's the latest we should pray Asr? <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, the, the, the last portion of that is more of a, a fiqh uh, question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I mentioned, uh, he, in the later part of the surah, he mentions the cure for hypocrisy or nifaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya yuhalladina amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah, wa man yaf'al dhalika fa'ulaika humul khasirun. O you who have believed, let not your wealth and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whoever does that, then those are the losers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the dhikr, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cure for hypocrisy. And the Mufassirin say, dhikr, the top of the dhikr is salah. So if you don't give up your prayer, especially your prayers in your jama'ah, and some of the hadith, they point out that it, it is very difficult for the munafiqun to go and pray at, uh, at night in, 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 uh, in dark. Asr is also important because it's, it's the time of the business. If you will so if you're going to go to us prayer then of course you might lose some business because underlying is what as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la wa la don't let your wealth and your children take you away from the remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the prayers they bring you closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially the tahajjud prayer the night prayer when you are away from the eyes of the people when you are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without anyone watching you, that is a sign of Iman. That is a sign of Ikhlas. So you have to do some activities, especially prayer at night, where you are away from the eyes of the people and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So prayer is indeed important and it is a way to cure hypocrisy. Not just when I say prayer, it's, uh, prayer is the topmost of dhikr, but also rem remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing your dhikr and whatnot, they all will remind you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep you away from the hypocrisy. Jazakallah. You mentioned that the hypocrites will be at the lowest place in, um, in hell. Why is it that the hypocrites have a much lower status than the kafir? Obviously, uh, because of, uh, at least the kafir is honest enough to say that I don't believe. But a munafiq, he's showing to outwardly to people that he believes, but internally there is no belief at all. There is no iman at all. And that is why their denying, their denial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much worse than the one who openly denies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pay them back 
on the judgment day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in Surah Al-Hadid. Since in this life, they are showing one face to the public and have another face in private, since they are deceiving people, they will also be deceived on the day of judgment. When people are crossing the Sirat, the Muslims, the Mu'mins, they will be given a light. And using that light, Allah, the Muslims will cross the Sirat. But the Munafiqun, they will also be given a light. But just they, they will think at that moment that, they, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a believer and I got a light like a believer. So see what I did. I mean, I lived my life really well in the, on the earth, not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was able to fool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was able to fool the people. Now look what happened to me on the day of judgment. I'm, I still have the light like any other Muslim. But just before they get on to the surat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extinguish their light. And they will fall. And we know the story. I don't want to go into the details of what happens in Surah Al-Hadid. Because of their denial and because of their uh, having these two faces, their denial is much worse. Their kufr is much worse than the kufr of a regular kafir who is openly declaring his kufr, whereas a munafiq is saying that I believe openly, but in, uh, but in his heart he does not believe. And as a matter of fact, they are the ones who deserve the very pit of hellfire, the bottom of the hellfire, because that is the hottest place compared to the other parts. Because as if you know, uh, the hellfire, uh, some of the scholars say it is a conical uh, inverted cone, and the bottom is the hottest place, and then of course the and then of course the, the, the heat will gradually uh, change from there. So hopefully that answers the question. So this is a clarifying question. I think you've already answered it, but uh, I, I think maybe it's worth just to to repeat the answer. If someone behaves like a munafik. Can we still not call that person a munafik? We cannot. We don't know what they have in their heart. As Muslims, we do not know people's intentions, what they have in their heart. We can never call someone a munafik. These characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he pointed out, it is for our own self, for us to introspect, and look at our own heart and see if we have any of those four diseases. If we do, then we take them away. We, we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We work hard to take them away. This is not for anyone. We cannot look at someone and say that, you know, he is breaking his promise. He is uh, uh, breaking his, uh, he is uh, betraying his covenant and uh, and whatnot. Uh, and we cannot call people that they uh, they are munafiq. If we, exactly. if any, if any of us feel that we have one of these characteristics, the first thing that we have to do is we have to repent to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, ask for His help to get rid of this habit, work hard to get rid of this habit. And as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in the, uh, sorry, as uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, they will only have this hatta until they give it up. So give up as soon as possible. Okay. And this, inshallah, will be the last question. Um, I heard a scholar say that all Muslims have some degree of hypocrisy based on their actions. This is obviously a worrisome situation. And you started to address this by talking about the cures for hypocrisy, remembering Allah, having attention to the prayers. Uh, maybe you can end by reviewing uh, a little, in a little bit more detail some of the other cures for hypocrisy so that we really have something tangible to take away and put into our lives, inshallah. Inshallah ta'ala. So the first thing, uh, as I uh, mentioned, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an We all, we are all here because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah Al-A'raf, that even before we came to this earth, we testified in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will worship him, that we will never be, uh, uh, that we will never go away from his path. But living in this, uh, in this world, the first and foremost things, the, the, the foremost things of, them, of many, if you will, that will take us away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the wealth and our children. How many times do we miss our prayers? in jama'a or otherwise because now we need to take care of our, uh, our children taking uh, your daughter somewhere to kumon or whatnot or you're taking your son to a soccer practice and things like that then you miss your prayer how many times people miss prayers including jama'a prayers 
because they want to earn some money. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling that don't do that. Don't have this element of hypocrisy in yourself. Don't let your money and your children take you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever does that, they will be amongst the losers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately says another cure in the next ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately tells you spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what we have provided you before death approaches. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one of the way to cure hypocrisy because the cause of hypocrisy is what? One of the causes is your money. But now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us spend that money because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this money. You spend that money in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will extinguish your desire for this world. That will destroy your desire for this world or at least alleviate, reduce, decrease your desire for this world if you spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also puts an element of uh, doing it quickly. He said, he says, He says, and spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you and he says, my Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be among the righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. And Allah is acquainted with what you do. The first thing is keep to your prayers, mother, uh, my dear brothers and sisters. When I say prayers, I'm talking about dhikr uh, in a comprehensive way, which includes prayers, first and foremost. Spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, don't delay. Don't think that you're going to wait until you get you become 50 before you start spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one has the guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're going to see 50, 60, 70 years now. This is the time to do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts the rush in these ayahs. He says, do it right now. So these are the cures that I mentioned uh, in these verses of Surah Al-Munafiqun. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our hearts, cure us uh, for nifaq if we have any, and inshallah gather us, all of us in, the, uh, um, in Jannah on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma amin wa akhru dan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran wa assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar.